blood pressure. Okay, this is just the nursing diagnosis that y'all will have, but you can use later on. Okay, perfusion. We're talking about perfusion now. Okay, so blood pressure. We know that when we're talking about blood pressure, there's two distinct sounds. Love and dub, right? Y'all remember that? Okay. And when we're talking about the numbers, there is a systolic, right, and diastolic. Systolic is the first sound that we hear when we're taking our blood pressure. Actually, it's not, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But that's the point of maximum pressure. Maximum pressure. Ms. Chandler just texted me. They have a baby girl last night at 923, so she got there on time. Presley Irene Webb, five pounds, eight ounces. Oh, tiny. Uh, 19 inches, 19 and a quarter inches. Presley? Presley Irene. Presley Irene. P R E S L E Irene. That's different. <laughs> Never good. Remember, you're being recorded. That's okay. I'll tell her that's different. <laughs> that's true. Presley Irene. Okay, that reminds me of mine. She's just the <laughs> We had a, I had a set of twins this weekend um, named Oakley and Aspen, and so I call them the twin, the tr twin trees. That's what I kept calling them. The twin trees, you know, oak and aspen. And we also have a little girl, we had a little girl named Nevea. You know what that means back? You know what that means? That's my favorite one. Nevea. That's really cool. They're wearing that out real quick. Yeah, they are wearing that. They're wearing me out with that. Okay, <laughs> diastolic. So the diastolic is when the ventricles are relaxing. So, you know, systolic is the point of maximum pressure, and then diastolic is when your ventricles relax. Okay, so the love dub sound, everybody should know that. Now, pressure, blood pressure, depends on a couple of different things. Depends on cardiac output, and cardiac output is the amount of blood that's pumped within a minute. Did y'all talk about this little formula in anatomy at all? Cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. Maybe kind of, sort of, at some point you've heard that. Okay. There's, you can actually calculate it. We're not going to do that, but you can actually calculate cardiac output um, by the heart rate and the stroke volume. Peripheral resistance affects blood pressure. Peripheral resistance is the uh, resistance to blood flow. What kind of things could cause a rise in peripheral resistance? If that's the, okay, a clot. Cold. Hmm? Cold. Plaque buildup. Okay, so any kind of clogging of the vessels. Um, I, I know I keep referring back to diabetes a lot, but but that is a um, condition that is unfortunately we're seeing a lot of on the rise. The people with diabetes have a very high risk of hypertension, and the reason for that is because a lot of people don't know this sugar acts just like cholesterol on the vessels. Sugar, what, it, what happens with sugar when it gets wet and then all the water's gone? It hardens, doesn't it, into a very cr crusty um, concoction. And that's what happens on the inside of your blood vessels is that sugar, people who have diabetes and it's very poorly controlled, that sugar lines the blood vessels just like cholesterol does and it causes hardening of the vessels. So... Um, diabetics can have an increase in peripheral resistance. So, of course, your blood pressure is going to go up with an increase in peripheral resistance. What's the normal adult blood pressure? 120 over 80. That changes all the time. When I was in school, it was 110 over 60. Now it's 120 over 80. What does that say about our population? Our health is kind of stinking, isn't it? Right? I mean, it really is. And the fact that our blood pressure the normal adult blood pressure is on the rise is not necessarily a good thing. Okay, blood volume affects blood pressure. We, we normally have a circulating blood volume of 5,000 milliliters, but people who are anemic or people who have lost a lot of blood, maybe they were in a traumatic car wreck and they had a lot of blood loss, what do you think their blood pressure would be? 
high or low? Low. low. It's going to tip, tend to run low because there's not enough volume to be pumped throughout the body. That 5,000 milliliters has dramatically decreased. Okay? Viscosity affects blood pressure. Viscosity is the thickness of the blood. There is a lab test that we can do called a hematocrit. Hematocrit tests viscosity of the blood. One thing that can affect viscosity is dehydration. If you're dehydrated, maybe you remember that picture of the guy who was out there mowing the grass and sweating everywhere? Mm -hmm. Okay, he's dehydrated. If we drew his hematocrit, when he's dehydrated, his hematocrit would be high. His blood would be very thick. Okay, so dehydration definitely affects thickness of the blood. And then elasticity, normally our arterial walls are very elastic. As we age, however, just like everything else that falls apart, the elasticity of our blood vessels falls apart. You may think that that would cause the blood pressure to become low, but it doesn't. Older adults who have lost elasticity in their arteries tend to have high blood pressure. And it's because the, the heart is trying to pump through veins that are not distendable or elastic. And so um, it tends to be high, it tends to be increased because it's working overtime to try to get it through, okay, to prevent it from backflowing. So a decreased elasticity actually increases blood pressure. Okay, let's talk about some other factors that affect blood pressure, age. <laughs> As we, as we age, blood pressure tends to increase. And we, we said that the normal was 120 over 80. Stress, what do you think that does to blood pressure? Increase. Definitely increases it. Your blood pressure yesterday was probably a lot higher than normal. Mm -hmm. Exercise would do what to the blood pressure? Lower it. Mm -hmm. At the time, it's going to do what? Raise it. Raise it. It's going to increase it. However, if you exercise on a regular basis, then your blood, your normal average blood pressure does tend to be lower. If you already have like a lower blood pressure, if you exercise, will it help bring it up a little bit just at a normal resting level? Mm -hmm. No, it won't. At the moment that you're exercising, it will. But okay, I thought something could be wrong with it. Like, no. It tends to be lower. No, average it out, no. Um, gender, what do you think about gender? Who do you think has? Men. Men do tend to have higher blood pressure through puberty, or I mean, excuse me, after puberty, after puberty. And women tend to have higher blood pressure after menopause. So men tend to have higher blood pressure after puberty. And then, then it and then it reverses, and women tend to have a higher blood pressure after menopause. And of course, that is not just the gender that affects it; it can be a lot of other things. Their their work environment, race can have an uh, have a effect. Hypertension. There's a greater risk in African Americans than in um, Caucasians. There are medications to raise and lower blood pressure. Obesity, what does that do? Increases it. Disease process. Diurnal variation. Remember we talked about temperature and how, how the time of day is affected? It affects the temperature. It also affects blood pressure. Your blood pressure is typically lower in the morning, in the early morning hours. It rises during the day. And then the highest, your highest blood pressure is going to be in the late afternoon and evening. So if you have a history of high blood pressure, you don't want to set your doctor's appointment for 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yes, darling? Can you repeat that process? I sure will. The, the diurnal variation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is lowest in the early morning. It rises during the day. And it peaks late afternoon and evening. You're welcome. So it may, that, that makes sense, though, doesn't it? Because you've done what throughout the day? When you're laying down at night, you're relaxed, aren't you? Your body's relaxed. Your mind is relaxed, hopefully. 
and your heart is relaxed, so your blood pressure tends to be a little lower. Then as we work throughout the day, we go to school, we get our job, we take care of our children, cook supper, whatever we're doing during the day, of course that would cause our blood pressure to go up. So be really careful, again, when you set your doctor's appointment. Okay, they do classify hypertension as mild, moderate, and severe. Mild hypertension, here's the numbers for you. And the moderate and the severe. What are some of the risk factors for hypertension? Smoking. Smoking. Weight. Weight. Drinking. Drinking. Yes, alcohol use. It is hereditary. Diet. Diet. Exactly. Diet can affect salt. What else do you think? What about your job? Stress? Daily stress? And ha living a sedentary lifestyle. We talked about exercise is good for your blood pressure because it does lower it. Leading a sedentary lifestyle like me, I hate exercising, I hate sweat, period. But leading a sedentary lifestyle will cause your blood pressure to increase. So those are some of the different things. And we talked about the disease processes, diabetics, people who have congestive heart failure, high cholesterol, all those things also can affect blood pressure. The problem with, with hypertension is that a lot of people are asymptomatic, and that is that is a scary thing because hypertension is a major risk factor in strokes and heart attacks. Um, most people who have a, had a stroke or a heart attack also have a history of hypertension. So. Being asymptomatic is not a good thing. And then there are some people who know their blood pressure is going up. Anybody have high blood pressure in here? A lot of you, how do you know it's going up? A headache. headache. And what else? Yeah. Little things before your eyes. You get the little floaters before your eyes. Maybe some dizziness or fatigue, weakness. So you know that it's going up. So, I, you know, this is one of those situations I think I would rather have symptoms and know when it's going up than be asymptomatic. A lot of women come into the emergency rooms with heart attacks and they're very atypical. They're missed because they don't have the typical symptoms. So, they have to be really, really careful of that. There is a reverse hypotension. Anybody have low blood pressure in here? <coughs> Like with hypotension, a couple of people have low blood pressure. There are some causes. Sometimes it is hereditary, but a lot of times it's because of that blood loss that we talked about, that blood volume loss. People who are anemic. Well, if a person bruises a lot, would they be hypertension? If they do a lot of no, not necessarily. That could that could be totally unrelated. Yeah, but it also can be a clotting issue. Yeah, I, have a, I have a clotting problem, and um, so I have to take vitamin B and folic acid all the time, and that causes me to bruise really easily. So it could be have so nothing to do with blood pressure. All right. Okay. What do people look like who have hypotension? What would you think? Their blood pressures. They're very pale. They, they, well, not necessarily. Some people can be have a liberal pressure and be, they may feel cool to the touch. They may sweat. Clamminess, they feel clammy. They may be confused. You may see some confusion. Nausea. Nausea. And something else, and I want you to tuck this in the back of your little minds. This is extremely important. This is one of those signs and symptoms that a lot of people miss for a lot of conditions that's a red flag that something's getting ready to happen have you ever noticed that some nurses can go in a room and look at a patient and say they're going to crash pretty soon they're getting ready to crash and you're thinking well how do they know that well one of the things that we look for is urine output okay if you go in a room and you notice that they have decreased urine output that is a sign that something big's getting ready to happen because what happens when the body is getting ready to go into a shock state, it decides, you know what, the kidneys are not that important compared to the brain and the heart. And so it starts to shut down perfusion to every other place. 
It's, and the urine output is one of those places. So always, always, always pay attention to your urine output. And that's something that we, we get really busy and we go in there and we pay attention to everything else and then we forget to look at the urine output. That is something, just tuck that in the back of your head because that's a red flag, okay? Start really paying attention to your urine, your urine outputs and then you'll catch stuff before it happens, okay? You may, know, not, you may notice nothing else, but all of a sudden, whereas they were putting out 500 milliliters in an in, um, eight-hour shift, now they've only put out 150. Okay, something's wrong, something's getting ready to happen because the kidneys have decided to shut down. There's something going on. Okay, so be really, really careful of that. What's orthostatic hypotension? What does that term mean? A change in position. So if you're sitting, lying, or standing, you remember how you, how, did y'all have to do that in your CNA classes? You take the blood pressure lying, then you have them sit, and you take the blood pressure in their pulse, and then you have them stand. If they have problems, it's like hypotension, for example, what's going to happen when they sit and stand? It's going to drop, right? But their pulse may rise. Their pulse may become tachycardic. And again, their body is trying to compensate for that change of status, that change in position. Okay. We have a question? Do you have questions for you? Do you have a question? No, just Oh, yeah, orthostatic hypertension, right. Okay. So you be really careful, too. Make sure that when you're checking somebody's orthostatics that you don't get them standing and then walk away because where are they going to end up? In the floor, right? And that nice little fall rate that we try to keep up with is going to go back to zero. All right, so we assess blood pressure using a fancy word called the sphygmanometer. But we don't ever talk, we don't ever say that, right? We say blood pressure cuff. Um, what is it just hypo, or is it hypo and hypo? You can see hypertension that way, but it's more typically seen. You see the hypotension, right? Okay, so a sphygmanometer and a stethoscope, a blood pressure cuff, and of course, most of the time now we're doing it. Um, electronically, even though you have to know how to do it manually. So you need to make sure that you brush up on your manual blood pressure. So we get lazy and we like to use those uh, machines, right? But the machines aren't always accurate. If they have an abnormal heart rate, and this is something else you need to tuck in the back of your mind. If you've listened to their heart sounds and their heart rate is irregular, don't even try to get their blood pressure using a machine because it will not pick it up accurately. You just need to go ahead and do it manually. Um, it can't pick up those extra beats or the skip beats, and so it's going to give you a false reading. So you need to make sure that you're doing that manually. Okay? There are some sounds called Karotkov sounds. Have you ever heard that term before? Some of you have. Karotkov sounds are the beats that you hear through your stethoscope from your blood pressure cuff as you're checking the blood pressure. And you need to know this for a more formal setting. Um, the first sound that you hear corresponds with the systolic blood pressure. So when you're listening for a blood pressure and you're rolling that, you know, you're opening the cuff and you're letting it come down and you're letting it come down really easy and gently, that first beat you hear is should correspond with your systolic blood pressure, okay? The fifth sound, the fifth Karotkov sound, corresponds with the diastolic pressure. Now, you're not going to hear easily two, three, and four, but what that's saying is that if we had the right kind of machine, it could actually measure, it could actually pinpoint each of those different heart sounds as you're listening. So, it's the fifth sound that's the diastolic pressure right before it fades away. If you're trying to take a blood pressure in the lower extremities, in the legs, where do you put your stethoscope? That's a catch. On the foot, okay. You can, right, where else could you put it? The femoral, you do femoral or popliteal. 
okay? Is it usually higher or lower in the legs? Higher. It's usually higher in the legs, about 10 millimeters of mercury higher in the legs. Um, and that makes sense, right? More pressure is put on our legs and feet than it is on our upper body. So it tends to be higher in the legs. Now, if you've got somebody, some little nine-year-old who is really in bad shape and they may even be dying, um, they're, you know, they're really, they're on their way to meet their maker and you try to get a blood pressure on them and it ju you just cannot hear anything. Have you ever had anybody like that? You just cannot hear their blood pressure. You can actually get a systolic blood pressure by what we call palpation, by palpation. So you take the blood pressure cuff, you pump it up, you don't even use the stethoscope, and you feel the brachial artery, okay, and as you're releasing the blood pressure cuff, when you start to feel the beat, that would be their systolic blood pressure. You can't get the diastolic, you can't get the lower number that way, but, um, you know, that's at least one way to tell that they have a, a blood pressure. Don't use that often. What kind of things might prevent you from taking a blood pressure in an arm? Okay, a mastectomy with a <clears throat> lymph node removal. You know, it's not just the it's not just the mastectomy that causes you not to have a, take blood pressures or stick in that arm. It's actually them taking the lymph nodes out. That's the catch. What if they took the lymph nodes out but didn't have a mastectomy? Because my mom had one side mastectomy, but they took lymph nodes out in both sides. You still you don't take blood pressures in those arms, and you'll still be, see people that do. I they're think supposed they to go do because I ask her. <laughs> they're supposed to go to the legs. They're supposed to go to the legs. I think they come on that. Because the pressure of a blood pressure cuff can cause the lymph nodes that are left to clog, and there's and if there's not enough there to drain, you can get some lymph edema in the arm. Yeah. Is there a time limit on that? Some people say there is a time limit, eight to ten years, but I think as a rule of thumb, it's just not a good idea. Period. Not to t just don't even worry about it, sticking or taking blood pressures. I know they told my mom it's like been 10 years. Yeah. And they could not tell her Yeah, I wouldn't. I just but be on the safe side. You don't want to get lymphedema. Um, cast, of course. You can't take a blood pressure over a cast. I hope y'all know that. Pick lines. Pick lines. You really don't want to take an, a, a blood pressure in an arm that has an IV, IV. period. Yeah. Any kind of IV. A pick line, an IV, anything. Because it will make it will clog off that IV. And boy, if you worked hard to get it, you will not be a happy person if you had to, if you clogged it off and have to start all over again. Dialysis shunt. Dialysis shunt. Very good. If there's a dialysis shunt in that arm, you definitely don't want to take a blood pressure in that arm. And they should have signs above the bed. If you go into a room and you know your patient has had a mastectomy or has a dialysis shunt or a pick line and there's no sign above their bed, take the initiative to put a caution sign above their bed. Go ahead and do that. There's nothing wrong with that. And you're being proactive for your patient. And the, the more proactive you are. And then you get, remember, you get those crazy lab people. Remember I told you about the lab people who came in and drew the blood on the dead person? You're going to have people that do that. So they come in there. Didn't I tell you that, that story? Oh, it must have been the PNs I told that story to. <laughs> we, right, when I, right before I started teaching, this has been I don't know, 13 years ago, 14 years ago, we had a patient that had died. We were talking about um, how you always put something on the door let them to let everybody know that the patient has passed away. You don't put a big old sign that says patient's dead or anything, but you put, you know, like a little lily or something on the door. And so we had a patient one night who had died, and even though we put that sign on the door, um, it was in the middle of the night, and the lab came up to draw labs, and we didn't know that they had gone back there. And they came, then they came up to the desk and they said that they just could not get any blood out of that patient and they didn't know what to do. Oh. And they were dead. And what I was trying to tell them is you've got to be very careful to pay it. What the, the moral of that story is to make sure that you know what's going on in the situation, that you're not so task-focused that you forget the patient. Um, the other story I told them really quickly is that um, 
we went to a conference one time, and another instructor at another school said that they had set up, and this is a great story to kind of remember when you go into the hospital, that they had set up a room for their students, and the task was for them to go in and give medications. That was their job that day. And so they had their MAR, they had their medications, and they set up the room, and they sent the first student in, and she did her her task great. She gave her, she had her MAR, she checked her meds against the MAR, and she checked her bracelet and gave the meds and everything, and came out, and she, the instructor said, you did great. You did a great, great job. You did your, your skill perfectly. You didn't miss anything, except you missed the family member in the chair beside them that had a big sign on it that said, I am not breathing. <laughs> Never once did they see that and do anything about it. <coughs> So the moral of that story is that there's more in a room than just your your task. Okay, you get, you know go in and talk to the family members and make sure they're alive and you know that they're they're going to talk back to you. Make sure your patient's not dead as you're giving them medicine or whatever. So you know we've got to be aware of these things and not become task focused. Anyway, that's where that story came from. Okay. All right, do you need to take a potty break? I know we went out for a fire. Y'all okay? If you if you just absolutely, totally cannot hold it, then you can waddle out of here and take a quick potty break. But we'll just keep talking. Okay, have you ever done the pee-pee dance where you keep your legs crossed and you're kind of... Okay, pulse. Checking our pulse. We know that a pulse is the... the when the blood has left the aorta and it gets to the ends of the arteries, that's the pulse that you feel. Okay, the heart contracts, the blood sits to the aorta, then the blood is out from the heart and sent to the arteries, and that's the pulse that you feel. What is a normal adult pulse rate? 60 to 100. Normal adult pulse rate is 60 to 100. Now, we can feel a pulse in a lot of different locations. Temporal, where's temporal? Temporal, and a lot of times, you know, if you've, if you've been running or exercising a lot, you can actually feel your pulse really good up in your temples. It's not, it should not be very strong. I mean, it should just be very gentle. You don't want to compress it. Sometimes if you press too hard, you'll actually cut it off. You can't feel it. So you got to be real careful. You know, you want blood to the brain, right? Okay. Radial, where's radial? Yeah. Wrist, radial. Now when you're checking pulses, and you need to remember this for checkoffs, when you're checking someone's pulses, you need to make sure that you're checking them both at the same time. So if I'm checking somebody's radial pulse, I'm checking them at the same time because I'm doing what? Again, just like lung sounds. I'm comparing, constantly comparing the sides. So if you feel one and then you take your hand away and feel the other, you're not sure. You want to make sure that the heart is beating or the, the pulse is the same in both. Right? If it's not, what could that indicate? A clot. Okay, decreased perfusion to that, that artery. So you want to make sure that you're constantly comparing. Brachial, everybody wants to say that their brachial pulse is right here in the bend of the arm. It is not. That is not the brachial pulse. The brachial pulse is a little bit above, okay, a little bit above the arm. And it's harder to find. Brachial pulse is harder to find. You have to, you have to really feel. Sometimes it's easier to feel on someone else than yourself. What do we use the brachial pulse a lot for? What do you think about to CPR? When do you use this? Babies, when you're doing infant and child CPR. When you're feeling for a pulse, you know how they teach you to feel for a pulse? When you're feeling for a pulse, we use the brachial artery to feel for a pulse in a child and an infant. Okay? Femoral, where's femoral? The bend of the leg and the groin. And again, you're feeling both at the same time. Dorsalis pedis, top of the foot. Dorsalis pedis is on the top of the foot. Poor circulation to the feet and legs, of course, would cause you to have a problem. However, if you can find someone's dorsalis pedis or posterior tibial, which is behind the ankle, 
if you can find those in someone, then they're going to have circulation. In other words, if you find a dorsalis pedis or a posterior tibial but you didn't feel for femoral, well, they're going to have a femoral pulse. If the blood's already gotten down to the feet, and you know, then you're then you've got blood flow, you've got circulation, so you can you can essentially skip the femoral if you needed to instead of filling somebody up. <laughs> okay, carotid. Now the carotid. Let me tell you something about carotid. You remember in Star Trek how he could how Spock could touch you know squeeze their neck and they pass out. Remember that? Y'all remember that? Yes. Am I aging myself? Vulcan. <laughs> Yes, okay. Well, you can do the same kind of principle with carotid arteries. You've got, when, when I say you comparing and you feel them at the same time, the only exception to the rule is the carotids. If you try to palpate someone's carotids at the same time, they're going to fall out like Dr. Spock, okay? And they're going to, I mean, they're going to pass out because if you, you're cutting off the circulation to the brain, okay? So you're feeling one at a time on the carotids. Everywhere else you feel them at the same time, but on the carotids, one at a time. Okay? One at a time. When somebody get hit in their face, like on the side, mm -hmm. is that what that is? That's what's happening. Exactly right. It's cutting off that circulation. Okay? All right. Apical pulse. Apical pulse, everybody, that, or a lot of people, I don't know who, what CNA instructor tells this, but they always say the apical pulse is right here. It is not right here. This is not apical. Apical is under the breast in the seventh intercostal space. And we're going to feel, feel each other up Monday and Tuesday. It's Monday to stay off. Okay. So get, get yourself psyched up to be to be um, fondled on Tuesday because okay? we're going to feel for, we're going to do heart sounds and stuff. Look, all the guys are like, oh, where are you going to find to be a partner? <laughs> <laughs> all right, where's popliteal? Behind the knee. Behind the knee. Behind the knee. Popliteal's behind the knee. And again, if you've got a pulse in your foot, probably... You really don't need to feel for popliteal, do you? Because it's gotten down that far, so we're okay. 